competition powers, though, and it is 4 p.m. on Tuesday, March 25th, and this is Joystick Streams. My name is Anthony John Agnello, Joystick Community Manager, and today we have a very, very, very special treat. We are playing the pre-alpha build of the tower defense and action RPG mixture known as Dungeon Defenders 2, and the uh, creators of Dungeon Defenders 2 are uh, joining us today from Trendy Entertainment. Uh, and leading the charge is, is Philip Asher. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Phil? Yep, yep. Pronounced it perfectly, in fact. Ah, perfect there pronunciation. <laughs> that's, that's our specialty here on Joystick Streams. Actually, that's not true. Our specialty is playing video games and talking about them <laughs> to you. Um, Phil, we also have uh, some, other, some other folks from the QA department over at Trendy joining us. Corey and Patrick, right? Yeah, let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Corey. I'm Patrick. Hi, Corey and Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, behind the, the keyboards of steel, what are you using today, Alexander? Uh, it's just the standard Alienware keyboard that came with the X51. A standard <laughs> Alienware keyboard is what Alexander Slowinski, Joystick News Content Director, is steering as he plays a little Dungeon Defenders with the Trendy crew. Yeah. Uh, Dungeon Defenders 2 follows up uh, Dungeon Defenders, which came out in 2011, and uh, got itself quite a following. Isn't that right, Phil? Yeah, it did, it did really well for us, so we're excited and afraid about releasing a sequel. Now, uh, tell us why you might be excited and afraid about releasing a sequel. What is, uh, what is different? What is new? What should people be looking forward to here? Oh, well, that's a, that's a loaded question. I think that we'll go over all of that and see all of it while we play the game. Yeah, Anthony, stop asking loaded questions. <laughs> loaded questions. You're just trying to get the hits. I see Alexander, how this is. What is the meaning of life as it's explored in Dungeon Defenders 2? That is... A loaded On a scale of win to fail, how do you think Dungeon Defenders will two will do <laughs> upon release? <laughs> oh, it's actually, the pre-show test, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But you're not allowed to use the word epic in any situation. <laughs> so um, I should go ahead and hit this play button, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We can all we'll, we'll hit the play button with you. Uh, Phil, actually, on the smaller scale, what are we going to be looking at right now? So right now you're going to be looking at a blank screen. <laughs> um, so this is the pre-alpha build of Dungeon Defenders 2. Uh, we've kind of built a shell around some of the core gameplay. Uh, and what we're going to be playing today is a mid-game level called Nimbus Reach. So. Now, you guys you guys are not. You are playing cooperatively. You are all teaming up. Yep. Together, right? It's all of us against the old ones and their evil forces. I hate those old ones. They're always... <laughs> Doesn't everybody? They're mustering up Shogoths and all kinds <laughs> of... Yeah, that's a little little HP Lovecraft humor for you <laughs> on Tuesday afternoon, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so how has the game changed since you first announced Dungeon Defenders 2? I understand that you're still in the pre-alpha stage. You have a lot of people testing the game on a, uh, on a daily basis, and even little things are still changing on a pretty regular basis. You were saying that that title screen was something that was just sort of thrown together uh, to make it look nice and cool with that little bit of animation. So what's what have you guys been working on? How's it been changing? So, uh, you know, the game has changed drastically since when we first announced it uh, way back almost a year ago now. But um, we basically rebooted the project a couple of months into it. Uh, just to, We learned more about what we wanted to do on the project and we refocused in on that just making a really great uh, tower defense action role-playing game. Uh, so there's, we're kind of following a more modern modern development cycle uh, than a lot of titles, so we're really iterating with the community. So, you know, a feature is never necessarily locked. It's, mm. They're always in flux. Uh, we have, since we started this reboot, essentially, uh, we've had about 500 hardcore community players playing the game uh, first every month and then every weekend once we had more stuff in. And when we have this feedback loop where they play the game and they give us feedback on the new stuff that's in there, and then we go bring that to the producers and they talk about it and they make action items of, 
about it and we focus on developing things depending on what people say. So that's why when you say, when I say everything's in flux, it's, it's because it is. Uh, we have a lot more now than we did a while ago. There's still, there's still a long ways to go, uh, but the game is a lot of fun, so. Uh, Phil, our, our managing editor, uh, Susan Arndt, who's hanging out in the chat, is noticing on the, the sort of warrior character that Alexander is. Uh, the squire. The squire, the, the squire class. Uh, his shirt's got little hearts all over it. Is that a is that a nod to Maximo by any chance? <laughs> it, actually, I think it was uh, in the original name game a uh, nod to Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Uh, originally, the Squire had uh, heart boxers, and uh, in the sequel, he's all grown up, so he's wearing pants now. Yeah, and, but, and Maximo uh, Maximo is the spiritual successor to uh, Ghouls and Ghosts, and uh, oh, like. Yeah, and like Phil uh, mentioned, uh, the Squire had little underwear, uh, little little heart-shaped boxers in the original one, but he seems to have filled that out a bit and now used it as a shirt. <laughs> he has. He's he has transferred the boxers to his to his wife beater, yeah. and now. So the um in the original Dungeon Defenders. Uh, the, 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 the four main characters, uh, were the same, but they were the kid versions of, of, uh, themselves. So are they, are they adults now? Are they, are they just older teens? Are they 20 somethings? And how does this fit into Dungeon Defenders, the original? So I don't think we've settled on exact age for each hero, but they're, they're in their late teens. Uh, they're older now, but they're still young. Uh, and basically, the story goes, it's a little different for each hero, but there's a period of peace uh, after they fought back the old ones at the end, end of the expansion of the first game. But now, uh, Eternia Crystals have started shattering. The old ones have started to come back into the whole land of Etheria. So they've each kind of left the individual things they were doing after the first game and banded back together to escort one of the Eternia Crystals to this castle area which you can actually see in the back of the map over here oh so that's uh, another thing i want to show before we before we set off the first wave um because uh that was sort of one of the weird things about the original dungeon defenders is it was just level after level but there was no real continuity to what was going on but uh dungeon defenders 2 kind of handles that because so talk a little bit about what's going on uh in the background yeah, so I'll continue from my story a little bit. So basically, they're escorting this Eternia Crystal to the castle, which you can see off in the distance. And the idea in Dungeon Defenders 2 is that all the levels connect. So you can actually see all of them. So you can see the castle over there, and all the associated castle levels are in that map. And if you look down a little bit, you can see Valley, which if we have time, we'll play that map today as well. Uh, and then you get to this ruins map here. And then if you look on the other side and you turn around, you can actually see the next ruins map which is this monolithic old one structure. And when you play that map, you actually be on the other side of it. So the idea is we really wanted to create a world map and a space that made sense uh, geographically and that people kind of understood their progression as they played, as opposed to just being like confused. I, I really, I, I love that. I kind of like that touch of creating a, a sense of physical continuity to everything you're doing. How? How do you think that grounds people when they're actually playing a game? Why is it important to have that continuity in the game? I think that it's something that you don't need to explicitly say to people, but they notice and get the feeling of. I'm sure a lot of you have played games in the past where you know you see this thing and you think it's pretty, and then all of a sudden it's a co-op game. You're, you're playing with your friends, and, you're, and then you guys realize, you're like, hey, wait, isn't that the other map right over there? And you're like, holy crap, it is. <laughs> And, you know, it's one of those things where it might not be recognized uh, instantaneously as, oh, yes, that's that map and this is this map, but you, the continuity exists nonetheless and you feel like you're progressing through the world. Uh, it's being careful with color palettes and all those things and changing and transitioning the player so that they actually feel like they're on a journey and heading towards something as opposed to just playing map A, map B, map C, map D. Uh, so, so, Alexander, I know you're about to queue up the first wave of enemies here, but I, I, I think that there might be... I, I realize that a great deal of trendy entertainment is also joining us in the chat, uh, but I think that there may be some people who are just tuning in 
uh, who may not have familiarity with Dungeon Defenders. So what are you about to do? So uh, Dungeon Defenders is a four-player co-op game, and uh, what you do is you uh, work together to set up defenses, like I am right now, uh, to keep waves of enemies away from the... Are they still Eternia Crystals? Uh, there's different objectives in these levels here. So sometimes you're saving an old man on a cart. Right now we're saving these uh, these ancient statues that if they break, they'll actually let the old ones come back from the other realm uh, in the shiny thing up at the top of the map. So uh, for those of uh, watching, you know, a couple things that are different this time around is you keep seeing these pink... Uh, streams that keep going by me. Uh, Phil, those are now the, the lanes, right? The pathing lanes for the yep. enemies? Yep. And there are also uh, like gold gold objectives? How, how, do we, how are we phrasing this? So there's two kinds of objectives. There's the main objectives and sub-objectives. So the objectives with the shiny gold shields above their head are the main objectives. If those fall, then we lose the match. We'll have to start over. There are also the sub-objectives. Uh, that's the seal stone with the nice silver uh, floaty shield above its head. And if that falls, we don't lose the match, but it opens up this additional lane in the middle of the map. So what that means is, you know, we, we lose, but, uh, and yes, there are more enemies, but they're easier to control because, like, right now we're just protecting the main course. If we were to place defenses here and here, we'd have two extra lanes to defend as opposed to just this one lane here. So it kind of makes the strategy more difficult if you want to protect the sub-objective. So for all of you watching at home, the, this silver objective here that I'm pointing at right now blocks this door. So if we lose this silver objective, this door will open and another lane will open up. So uh, pink streams will come out of there too. So I should probably set up a couple uh, walls here. Uh, Phil, we have a couple of questions here from the chat. Infamous Fairy wants to know, you know, if these are the adult versions of the characters from Dungeon Defenders 1, where are their parents, and why are they not more concerned? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, their parents actually show up back at the castle at the end of the first game. I don't think that we figured out exactly what their parents are doing while you're exploring here, but I think that all kind of, all of Etheria is uniting, and they're old enough now where they're, they're, either allowed or reluctantly allowed to go out on this adventure. Uh, we have a, another question here from Blez, and Blez has a, a far more specific question and wants to know if the UI will be more intuitive and give a better overview of what options you have. Blez is saying that something that sort of was a problem for them in the first game was that it was overwhelming. I can answer that. <clears throat> this is Alexander. I can certainly answer that uh, having played it. Yes, uh, it is definitely more intuitive uh, than the original game was. So, Phil, I just spared you uh, having to answer that question. Um, well, also, uh, why, Alexander? It's, I mean, it, it just is. Like, you know, it's, it's, ask, it's like asking the, 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 uh, the, the word for people... Uh, doing dirty things on videotape, uh, you know, like you know it when you see it. It just, ah. um, it just is more intuitive. Also, I want to point out that Mr. Spinney, uh, who is my favorite uh, character from uh, or favorite defense uh, from the original Dungeon Defenders, is back, and now he's uh, graphically updated to have a face. Uh, Phil, can you upgrade Mr. Spinney uh, just to show how the the visuals change on uh, defenses now? Yeah, I can. Can you press? Oh, here you are. Or actually, can uh, I'll drop some mana and we'll pull our mana together and can, can you guys come over here and drop him some mana and he can upgrade it. Hooray. Oh, <laughs> okay. You should have enough now. How do I upgrade again? Press Q and then click on it. And Mr. Spinny is freaking out. Uh, I need more mana. I need more mana. <laughs> you guys drop a little bit more. Come on, man! I'm just asking for some more mana. I ain't asking for much. <laughs> and a sandwich. I want mana and a sandwich. <laughs> Don't get greedy now. Don't get greedy. How could you expect to get your mana if you don't eat your sandwich? And then, uh, uh, and then another thing that's uh, changed is you can actually move around now while you're upgrading, right? Or, or yep. placing. 
Yep, you can move around during all those. We actually, in the first game, the camera would often... See, there yeah. you see. The there camera you would Stop spinning. The... Stop yeah. spinning, Mr. Spinning. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> slow down. Oh, uh, he's not going to slow down. Can we have so, the hunters play some geyser traps on both sides where there's a, those electric for us? Yep, didn't see anything. What are you guys saying? Phil, another uh, question here from Excessior. Uh, will other classes have different build resources like the Summoner did in Dungeon Defenders 1? Uh, well, we're trying to avoid that this time around. Gotcha. And why is that? What was the problem with the Summoner in the first one? Well, so the problem with the Summoner in the first game was that he made the game a lot easier to mm. play if you had one on your team because he had a separate resource pool by which he could summon his minions. So in essence, you could get all the normal defenses you can get on a map, and if you had a summoner, plus some. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be trying to avoid this time around. We, we did it in the first game, uh, kind of, uh, you know, young independent development studio. Like, <laughs> <laughs> kind of realizing we broke the game, and uh, we decided not to break the game this time around. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we were like, okay, we have this cool idea for a hero. He's an RTS hero, and then we started to make him, and then we're like, wait a minute, but now no one will use him because he's harder to use, <laughs> and you have to sacrifice defense units to play stuff. So we're like, all right, well, let's just make another pool, and, and obviously broke the game. So. Well, I, I'm fascinated by that sort of learning process when you're building games. Well, I you mean, can talk, Anthony, while we set the, off this first wave. So go ahead and set it off. Yeah. Well, I, what I was gonna what I was gonna ask Phil was I'll how take the river high. Take the river how do you recognize when something like that just isn't working, and you can say, all right, well, it's time to let go of this, and it's time to change this in our next iteration because clearly it's it's broken. How do you recognize when something's broken, and how do you let that go? It's something you made. It's something you have an attachment to as part of the design. It's it's such a difficult thing to do, uh, and it's something. Actually, Alex, can you press G so we can kick off? But um, it's really it's really difficult to do, and it, we're trying to make it easier in DD2 by putting putting processes in place uh, that the community, the way the dev team interacts with the community so that we can recognize when that's happening beforehand, mm. fix it. But uh, it's it's very difficult because let's say you put in a character like the summoner and then you remove him. Yes, a lot of people were complaining because he was overpowered, but then there's going to be a lot of people upset because they liked that he Being was overpowered. overpowered. Right. So it's it's very difficult to kind of, you know, strike that balance. Mm. between, you know, what do you keep in and what do you remove. So the best thing to do, and what we're trying to do with the sequel, is have a group of people play really early and catch problems like that before they become problems. So that then if we remove something that people are complaining about, uh, you know, we have time uh, to fix it and to get it back in and to make it better before the community at large gets it. What do you... So, you know, obviously you need that resource. You want to have a big pool of people playing the game for you. What else do you need to recognize those problems? What else do you need as part of your development process to make sure that you tackle all those things? Is it is it just time? Is it having a specific, you know, workflow set up so that you can tackle things and iterate really quickly? What do you what do you need besides testers and players? Well, I think there's you hit on the two major things you know, w one of them really is time, uh, and that's something, you know, we see all these early access things going for better or for worse, but a lot of what those let people do is they let people have that time to iterate on the game, uh, right? If you're an independent developer, there, there used to come a point when you're like, okay, I have to release the game today, or we have no more money. Mm -hmm. And now, the, you know, there's things in place where it's like, okay, well, we could sell the game to a couple of people, and they could keep playing it, and we have a few extra months to work on the game. So definitely time is the biggest one. It takes a lot of time for people to play the game, and then it takes a lot of time for uh, you to get the feedback and to process it and to actually act on it. Mm. And then the other one, like you said, is also just processes. Uh, in the first game, you know, young, fledging indie developer, uh, people would jump on our forums and be like, we want this fixed, we want that fixed. So we would fix it. Except that sometimes those things weren't broken, and it was just a few people mm 
that were really upset about it, but really the community at large wasn't upset about it. Uh, so you have to have the proper process and the proper people who can look at that feedback and determine what that feedback actually should mean for the game. Mm. That seems like such a difficult thing to manage to me when you're when you're dealing with instant community feedback it's sometimes hard to know what to prioritize because really at the end of the day every voice you're hearing is at the same volume you can't tell what's what's a loud complaint and what's a quiet complaint always because they're appearing in the exact same way it's you know it's forum posts it's twitter messages it's all this how do you how do you figure that out how do you pr prioritize what feedback you get from players. So I think that there's a lot of small processes that we and other developers are putting into place to prioritize the information. Uh, some of it's actually metrics. Metrics mm -hmm. of the game can tell you, you know, a great example uh, from a colleague in the studio is he was working on a shooter. And I won't say which one, but they had a gun and people were complaining that the gun was overpowered, except that when you look at the, the score, and you saw how many kills it got, it had less kills than every other gun. <laughs> and and so it, it wasn't overpowered, but hundreds of people in the community were claiming that the gun was overpowered. So the question is, okay, well, what was it? So, you know, they, they went at it and they looked at it and they found out that the thing was that if you, the gun had like really cool effects and stuff. So if you got killed by it, you were upset because it like looked cool and you were really upset. It looked way cooler than getting killed by any other gun. So the, the thing was is that people rarely got killed by it, but if you got killed by that gun, you were really upset and you thought it was overpowered. <laughs> God, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So, like, so, like, what it was was, it was like a psychological feedback rather than something that was mechanical. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to parse that, and that's, that's what takes time and takes a really great... We have a really great community manager, Josh Iceland. You need a really great community manager who can figure out, uh, you know, what and parse what people are asking for into actionable things that the dev team should actually do hmm. to change the game. Um, Excelsior has another question here. Is loot all shared like it was in Dungeon Defenders 1? Nope. So we've actually done a lot of anti-griefing stuff to try to encourage people to play together a little more than compete with each other. Uh, so loot is actually instanced now. And so is the mana from chess. Hmm. So you can still drop mana if you want, you know, one of your friends to be the builder and you want him to build everything. You can go collect the chest and then drop him mana. But uh, but loot is instanced completely. So. Alexander, what are you doing right now? <laughs> I am adding some ballistas to <laughs> the roof over here because uh, from the canyon high path, uh, that you can see here off in the distance. Uh, wyverns are going to come out of that, or, or flying-type enemies are probably going to come out of that, and I want uh, the ballistas to take care of them. Along with, I don't know, what are these ice rocket-looking things? Like, what are those? I've never seen them before. Those are my ice towers, so those actually slow enemies down uh, when they hit them, and uh, if they hit an enemy long enough, it'll freeze them. And then, actually, if you build some of your cannonball, turrets here, those can deal smashing damage. Those can actually shatter them in one hit if they're frozen. So, Those are my ice powers. Uh, Foxon wants to know, will there be more or less emphasis on either combat or tower defense? Is there is there one way that the game's sort of a special blend of uh, influences uh, it leans. Is there is there an emphasis on one over the other? Is there is there more time spent in combat than there is in setting up defenses in the game? So, our one of our development pillars is that there is equal tower defense action and role playing, and that all of those combine to support each other and not hurt each other. Uh, so that's what our goal is. In practice, it really depends on how you play and how you choose to level your hero. Uh, you know, if you really focus in on improving your abilities or improving your hero stats, you can play the game with more action in it than if, for example, you put all your points and stuff into defenses. So it's something that, you know, so right now we actually don't even, we're almost about to implement the character progression system, but it's not quite in yet, so our community hasn't gotten to play with it. So it's always been a, a tenuous thing where they're like, oh, today's build is more hero-focused, and today's build is more... <laughs> 
is more defense focused and we're like we know <laughs> so you'll be able to choose so it's going to be partially up to the player we are trying to eliminate uh from the first game uh, there are parts of the game where you could just not play mm. like it would just be it would just you'd get powerful enough and it would just beat the map for you mm. uh Ooh. so you would just sit and walk away from your computer and go have lunch and then come back and pick up your loot uh we are trying to eliminate that because that's not fun so while while Alexander was setting up those ballistas, uh, Phil, Patrick, Corey, what were you guys doing on the rest of the map? What were you setting up? Um, as the monk, I set up a lot of support towers. So I've got a tower boost aura uh, over here. That uh, if a tower falls, it'll heal Wh all the hold towers. Hold on, hold on. Which character are you? I am the monk. Okay, hold on. Let me so find you for a second. Okay. Because then I can show. Okay, now now go back to where you were. There this we go. This is the tower aura. Um, it buffs all the towers and gives them a little bit more damage. And if a tower falls, it will heal all the towers in there. Uh, so that's that's a very support based tower. I also have right in front of it our uh, lightning aura, which combos with the huntress's geyser traps to electrocute enemies which will stun them and deal a lot of damage at the same time. And the geyser trap is this water green looking thing right here on the floor? Yeah, yeah. that's, that's oh, um, this thing. geyser trap. And I'm, as the Huntress, I've been building a lot of traps in different places. I have the explosive trap, which is similar to the one that was in DD1. And then I also, I don't remember where I put it, but I built a blaze balloon. I'll just build another one. And this, uh, we can shoot the balloon down, and it will cause yep, it'll cause a big Sorry. fire attack <laughs> that enemies will get uh, hit by. And if I throw an oil flask on them, it'll light them on fire. Okay, let's start the next wave. So one of the new systems that we've added into Dungeon Defenders 2 that everyone's been kind of hinting about is uh, this combo system in the game. And basically there's a bunch of different elements like there were in the first game, but now they actually combo together to do cool things. So you know in the first game you had uh, an aura which slowed enemies, but now if you use your lightning aura and the Huntress places a water trap, then that will stun enemies, in effect slowing them. So there's lots of cool combos like that, ways to encourage cooperative play uh, between the different heroes. Um. You know, Phil, something that sort of fascinated me about the original Dungeon Defenders, it's how I came to know about the game wasn't by playing it, but by discovering and reading about the very unusual and robust culture of cheating on the <laughs> Xbox 360 version of the game. And it was, it was fascinating to me because you saw people cheating on, in a console version of this game in very elaborate and strange <laughs> ways. Uh, you know, plugging in USB devices to get ridiculously overpowered weapons and that sort of thing. And, I, like, that, like, it's fascinating to see a game played like that, but obviously as a developer you don't want to see people cheating. That, that, can, that can damage the growth of a community. Uh, so, tell me what you learned from that experience of seeing people you know manipulate the game in wild unintended ways so i mean it's actually one of the major reasons why the sequel is going to be free to play so we can run it off of dedicated servers and uh not have the cheating problem mm. um it's it's really interesting so you know it, it's cheating is usually a problem on consoles but there are not really many loot games, so it, it was never as much of an issue with our game. But with our game, once you know people started to hack it and they can get, you know, any of the loot they want, it became a huge issue. And you know, you, to the extent where you had people, you know, it wasn't even fun for a normal player anymore mm -hmm. because you would go online and someone would jump in your game and drop you every best item ever, and you're like level one, and you're like, oh well. I don't have anything to do anymore. Mm. So, so yeah, yeah, it was a it was a big problem. So in the second game, the game is run server side, uh, mm -hmm. so you can't hack it. So, 
not only you said that the reason that you've gone free to play is also a a you know a, an effort to prevent that sort of che cheating how will that prevent cheating so uh one of the major ways to prevent or really the the only there are lots of ways to do it so i don't want to bite my words but the most effective way uh is also the most expensive way which is running a lot of the game logic on your servers mm. uh, and so if you do that you know what, what would happen in the first game is people would do memory hacks right the game has to process information so I don't know if I'm getting too technical. The game has to process information, so they would interject into that information what they preferred it to process. And you can encrypt it and do a bunch of other things, but you know, eventually people will figure out a way to do it again. So this game, a lot of that game logic runs on our servers. Mm -hmm. So when you see a piece of loot, our server generated you the piece of loot and you get it, but you don't have control over how that piece of loot generates. So. That, that is what helps the hacking. Now, where does that fit into free-to-play is that it, it ends up costing a lot of money for us to run the servers. So free-to-play is uh, kind of, you know, I hate to use that word because it has such a bad reputation, but it basically lets you run a game as a service, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can have, a, where basically you get revenue over time instead of revenue all at once. So I, I would say, imagine this way, you're a developer and you made a game which your servers run the game, but you release it as only $10 and people can never, they have no other way to spend money on the game. Well then every month that the game's up, you're just losing money from the $10 that people spent. So eventually you'll run out of money just by people playing. So. Now I can see I can see the economic benefit in designing Dungeon Defenders 2 this way, and I can see a a mechanical benefit to it as well. That's that's going to protect protect the integrity of the foundational design. It's going to make sure that people who are playing it are are playing it as intended, and they're not going to potentially be ruining the good time of people who come into it for the first time fresh and don't know anything about it. Uh, but is there is there anything you lose in that process of converting to you know this model? Is there is there anything that is lost at a, at a design level, and is there anything that you lose in your potential reach in an audience? Uh, well, I would argue to say no. It obviously depends on how you do it. Uh, so, you know, clearly you have games like Path of Exile, which are doing really well with only offering cosmetic improvements to the game, mm -hmm. right? So, I would, a lot of people assume that it's a given that you have to lose something to be free to play, but I would argue that it's not. What it does do is it creates a bunch of interesting questions that the designers then have to solve that you wouldn't have to solve if it was a direct download, right? So, it makes development a lot more challenging because you want to make the best game. You want to make a game that everyone will enjoy more than if it was a downloadable title, right? Because what's the other, what's the point of doing it? And mm. that's not the point. And so it's it's new waters that you have to travel in, though, because it's not like you just look at a game, right? You don't look at Blizzard's free-to-play game. And you're like, well, everyone loves this, so let's do that. You have to kind of be like, okay, no one's ever made a tower defense role-playing game that's free-to-play. So how do we do that, and how do we make it cool, and how do we make it good, and how do we make people go, oh, I'm glad this is free to play, as opposed to, oh, I hate it, it's free to play. So, uh, Some of the trendy team was answering these questions already in the chat, but I wanted to talk a little, a little bit about them with you, Phil. Uh, there, I, right now, it's going to be PC, Mac, and Linux uh, for Dungeon Defenders 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, while there is excitement and interest in the new consoles, that's not part of the plan now. Uh, is there a timeline once, you know, once Dungeon Defenders 2 is finished, it's, it's uh, out there, it's, it's something that is not in pre-alpha or alpha or beta, it is a finished game. Uh, is there a timeline for possibly bringing it to other platforms? We would... I, I'm unfortunately, I'll try to throw in some more information instead of just reiterating what you said. <laughs> but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we don't know yet and we would absolutely love to be on consoles and it's something that we're actively investigating. Uh, whether it's going to be at the same time or after or a long time after, something we don't know because we're investigating it. Uh, it's really about seeing if the vision of what we have for the game 
if that can fit on consoles. And then if it does fit on the consoles, you know, when and how can we as a team build out that experience? Yeah, now, that... Phil, now oh, Phil, sorry. one of the things, uh, so, you know, maybe it's not coming to the consoles yet, but will there be uh, 360 controller support uh, there for will the be game? 360 controller support. Okay, good. Cause... Don't worry about it. There will be 100% beacon. It's not 100%? 100%. 100% eventually there will be controller support. So I don't like that one. eventually in there. Because cause this mouse I keyboard thing is... It. I, realized, I realized I might eat my words on that when we do a soft launch and there's not controller support. Yet. <laughs> I think it, it's one of the interesting things to also answer the question about the first game. Where, you know, the first game we actually developed console first. Really. We, we, it was intentionally, like, XBLA was what we thought was going to be our biggest platform for the game mm. uh, when we started development on it. So, it, interestingly, when the, when the Steam version first came out, the, the keyboard support was kind of lackluster. <laughs> and we had to improve that as the game progressed. So, this time around, uh, we, are, we, are, we focused in on trying to make it control as good as we could on keyboard with the intention of going back in and taking a look at what we did on the first game with with controllers and improving that for the sequel. Mm. Alexander, you you are, are you sounded oh, like no. you emphatically wanted that uh, Xbox 360 controller support, but you're acquitting yourself very well with mouse and keyboard. You're making it happen. N no, I'm not. I'm, These goblins and old ones are, are, are getting, no, getting I, a what I, for I am, I am definitely not playing as clean as I would <laughs> if I was if I had a controller on me right now. But I'm glad you think I'm doing well. It looks that's... like you're doing well. Oh, the sub objective is getting going down. <laughs> All right, we need every. I, we need people to come. If the top's okay from the airways, we definitely need people to come down and help. Here. Is if that the silver one in front of the portal? Oh no. I'm going the wrong way. Alexander, this might. Be, you may have be... lost the sub objective because you weren't nice enough to your dog. <laughs> Shh, don't mention him. He's away right now. <laughs> uh, Phil, Snipe Hockey wants to know if you have ever considered adding more characters after the game is officially out there, after the soft launch. Is there is there any possibility of moving beyond these four? Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, we don't have them in the game right now. Uh, we have some early designs for some additional heroes that we want to do. I think the real question for us with the sequel has been how much effort do we put into an individual hero? Uh, and that's been bouncing up or down. So depending on where that ends up finalizing, uh, that will determine how many extra heroes there are. So a good example is, you know, in the first game, if we add an extra hero, you have to create a hero, you have to create an animation set, you have to create, uh, you know, five defenses. In this game, there's a lot more. All of the defenses have multiple art for each upgrade that you do. The heroes have abilities and towers which can combo together. They're gonna have some interesting ways you can level them up. So it's really, we're just waiting to see where it falls on how expensive it is to make a new hero uh, and go from there. Uh, now, uh, EMP Dank Doobies, which uh, is a hell of a username, <laughs> um, wants to know if those characters will be made available for free or if they will you know be part of the monetization model uh something that you need to buy the uh, game is free what do you want <laughs> yeah the game is free but if like will will the characters just be considered part of an update or so once again the characters are a while away uh we're not sure it's something we're actively talking to our community about uh, it's one of those things where, so we as a development team are really focused on trying to provide a free-to-play experience that is legitimately free-to-play, <laughs> as in like it's it's free to play and the and we don't content gate people. Uh, but you know we also see a lot of people in the community sometimes say, okay, well you know what would you be happy for paying for? And they say, okay, well I'd be happy paying for heroes. So so you know it's we're still we're still really actively thinking about that and trying to figure out what's best for the game and what's best for the community. It harkens back to what I said before. It's, it's new grounds, it's a new area. Mm. So 
it's really hard to pick which side of the fence you fall on. Hey, Phil, anyway. Phil, I, I just, I just want to give you a, a, a pro tip business-wise. <laughs> if your game is free and your characters are free <laughs> and everything else is free. Now, I get it. I, I understand that, that customers and, and, and players like free stuff. But at some point, if they want a Dungeon Defenders 3 and they want Trendy to <laughs> exist as a company, right. <laughs> somebody's got to pay. Yeah. Really? So, so, no, I mean, that's exactly the challenge is how do you give people things that they want to buy? And what are those things that they want to buy? So it hits the nail on the head, right? You need to make money. You, I, if we could work on a game forever and not have to make money, then everyone would release free games. Because all I want is for pe the most amount of people to play the game and to make the game as good as possible. And I appreciate so. your very hippie outlook on that. <laughs> but... I mean, it's, it's really true for most development studios to an event. There's just lots of, there's lots of economics in the way of doing that, unfortunately. Phil, so that, like, the process of getting over the psychological hurdle of a free-to-play game for reaching a player is something that just fascinates and frustrates the hell out of me. <laughs> because, you know, you were, you were talking before about uh, your, your developer friend working on a shooter, and they put a gun in the game, and people have this impression of the gun. They think the gun is overpowered, but it actually isn't. The data doesn't bear that out. And when people talk about a free-to-play game, they look at it, and they, they have this preconceived notion of what it's going to be like. It's either going to be sort of milk toast, and it's, you know, not going to be as polished as something else, or it's going to be nickel and diming the player at every step of the road. Like, you know, it's, it's going to be gating them on time, it's going to be gating content, and it's, you know, it's not going to be really free at all. How do you get past that? How do you get around people's idea of what a free-to-play game is and just make something that is great? I would, I would love to hear uh, in the comments, comments thread of this Twitch chat what uh, our viewers think. I mean, that is the question, and we don't know the answer to that yet. It's really funny. I've always complained about it. You know, you go to Steam, right, and there's no pay-to-download section, but there's a free-to-play section, and it's really kind of, uh, it's really kind of sad that you have a game coming out, and the number one thing people are concerned about is its business model, because it shouldn't be, right? It should be, is the game fun? Do I have fun playing the game, etc.? And I think that the industry hasn't quite learned how to adapt to that because it's evolved so much. Mm. You know, for, first we went from all $60 games, so it was really easy. You judge the game based on whether it was worth $60. And then we started to lower the price and then it became more difficult because it was like, well, how do I judge this game? It's not as good as a $60 game, but it's only $10. Mm. So is it worth the money? And that, now the even harder problem of, okay, there's, it's a shop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is it? That, so. that perception of value is something that fascinates oh, me. I might lose. Uh, people, we're, <laughs> we're, sorry, hold on. No, no problem. QA people, do your job! <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, you know, we were talking about Metal Gear Solid oh. because of our, our titling problems at the top of the stream. But that's a game that people are like, oh, well, it's an hour long, but it's $30.00. And that's, there's this okay, disparity. They, they think, oh, that's a problem. But, you know, you go back 30 years, and I, I love this. I saw a picture of a boxed copy of Frogger for Atari 2600 the other day. And the price tag, the original price tag underneath everything was $80. Yeah. $80 for a copy of Frogger, a game that technically you can finish in five minutes if you play it right. <laughs> So how how do you how how do you figure out what people think is valuable? Wait, hold, hold on before we do that. This is a boss, right, Phil? This is a mini boss. Uh, a mini boss. Mini boss. He's... Yeah, the bosses are gonna be awesome and and way cooler. Our mini bosses are now like the first game's bosses. This is a ogre trying to take out. Doing a pretty good job though. So... Go get him, Alexander. I think it's this this blaze balloon that just keeps dealing him fire damage. Finish. Uh. 
Yeah. Is there anything specific that needs to be done to bring down the mini boss that is different than the other bosses, or is he just or any other enemies, or is he just super strong? So uh, we have a we're gonna have a bunch of different mini bosses in the game, and they all have different purposes. So the ogre's purpose he's primarily defense focused. So he is going to aim for your defenses and try to take them out. And you can see he took out literally all of the defenses that we had placed in these front two lanes and the sub objective, and almost started taking out these defenses to go to the main objective before he kind of got in and started to attack him. Uh, we're gonna have other guys as well. So mini bosses are kind of like not events. They're, thing, they're enemies that happen that you have to respond to and are fun to respond to and have good rewards. And bosses are like, oh, it's a certain point in the storyline. This level is built around this boss being in the level, uh, you know, to, to really have large effect. They also, since they're a bigger mob, drop special loot that's a lot higher tiered. And uh, this this ogre drops a lightning sword, which deals lightning damage to enemies when you hit them as the squire. Actually, can you mark that on the map? Yep. Right there. Mm. <laughs> oh, there we go. So if you press F, you can equip it. And so what's really cool is, like I said, one of the pillars is that <laughs> the action, the role playing, and the strategy all all work together in the tower defense. So. Basically, you know, the combo system that we talked about for abil abilities and towers is on the RPG elements, the loot and the leveling as well. So now that he has this, actually if Huntress wants to build some more geyser traps, oh, yeah. now that he has this lightning sword, uh, if we place the geyser trap, which uh, waters enemies, they get the water debuff and he hits them and we'll get electrocuted. So They're going everywhere. So, Huntress is time to shine. Exactly. So another question from the chat here, Jay's Two Kings wants to know, is there any form of PvP in Dungeon Defenders 2 since the MOBA mode was removed? Um, not in its current build right now. Uh, we're really heavily focusing on making the co-op as good as we possibly can. Uh, if that does really well and people want a PvP mode, we have some cool ideas of how we could do it better than what we we're attempting to do. Uh, a year ago, uh, but we're not actively working on it right now. So, I think that Phil, I need to build a lot more defenses. Uh, again, we still have one more wave, right? Yeah, we still have one more wave. Oh boy, okay. We can actually just kind of huddle in this area here. I think that uh, this area is pretty well defended. <clears throat> if you want to come to the side of the crystal, though, the side of the lower main objective, where I just pinged on the map, uh, we could definitely use, like, yeah, barricade there. We need barricades in the entire back. That whole area fell. And then if you want to follow the Huntress up to the back, you can get some stuff there. I'll, I'll place it across the right here. Huntress. Where'd you go? Sorry. I'm the monk. Hello. There we go. Okay, where am I going? Here? Yeah. Where do you want the bridge? Just right in front of the water trap? Probably. Alexander, a quick Probably. question. Wait, hold on. I want to stop for a second. Probably? You're the one who knows how to play this game. You have to tell me. So here? Yes. Here or here? Like, okay. Probably. You know. Maybe. Uh, Blaze wants to know if there is a way to look at the leveling and weapons menu. Alexander, do you have access to that while you're in a fight, or no? Um, he can actually go up to the forge right now and take a look at the very temporary uh, menu. Gotcha. That's not the ancient statue, right? Where's the forge again? Yep, oh, right never mind, there. I got it. The forge is cool. It's actually something in this game that we had uh, the group of players which we call our defense council that are playing help design. So we sent them a bunch of concept art, and they told us what they wanted to change for it, uh, and we kind of went back, did some revisions, and came up with what he's looking at now. For the, the 3D model, the inventory screen is very temporary. Yeah, I also have to agree with Blaze, Blaze, uh, in, Blaze. Blaze, uh, Blaze, in the chat. Uh, yes, emphasis on co-op equals win. That's the entire point of Dungeon Defenders, is to play with friends and enjoy each other's company and defend against the 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 elder elder evils of the world. 
Yeah, and that's what we're tr really trying to uh, emphasize that more than we did in the first game by putting in a lot of new systems and stuff which encourage cooperative play. We really want people to be like, so in the first game we did a survey of our community and we was like, oh, how is it, what way is the most fun to play the game? And people would say, okay, the most fun is to play with your friends. And then the second most fun is to play alone. And the third most fun is to play with strangers. So our goal with the sequel is to try to flip the last two around. So the first most fun is playing with your friends, but the second thing that's the most fun is playing with strangers. And then the third thing is playing by yourself. I also so. have to hand it to Trendy. Uh, one of the things that you guys did with the original Dungeon Defenders, when, when I originally played on XBLA, there was, uh, you know, there were there were clearly a lot of things missing. The the way the item like I, I, you couldn't even see the items, or the way it was divided was weird. Like I don't even remember anymore because once Dungeon Defenders got onto PC, and honestly, for anyone listening, if if the only time you ever played Dungeon Defenders was uh, when it was on XBLA, I highly recommend uh, getting it on PC. Uh, whenever you, whenever you have the chance, uh, because the amount of upgrades that were done on the original Dungeon Defenders on PC was ridiculous. <laughs> there were so many upgrades and updates and tweaks and fixes, and it was it was really one of those situations where it was great to see uh, a developer, uh, you know, f fixing things that you you could have just you could have just moved on to the sequel and saved it for then, but uh, they weren't things that were broken necessarily, but uh, they definitely experience. Yeah, I think that you know we were we were starting at when Dungeon Defenders came out. It wasn't really a thing yet to kind of release that kind of updates, and we were, we along with a bunch of other developers were you know starting to do that, and it was just kind of the desire to we have this large group of players. Let's let's give them the best game that they want. Uh, Instead of, you know, I don't necessarily, I understand, but don't necessarily think that the idea of saving it for the next game for smaller features applies too much. You know, if you want to add in, like, a whole new game system, then maybe yes. But in terms of, like, should we fix this issue? Oh, stupid no. purple dinosaur! I hate this guy! <laughs> oh, he's the worst! I didn't even get to yell about that before. Uh, so anyway, we lost the silver objective here in the middle, and that's why the, the middle one is now open, uh, as, as the folks at home can see. Uh, but yeah, we, we didn't get to really show off a lot of the, uh, the enemies and, and the detail work that went into the enemies this time in the animations. Um, but that's, that's certainly something that uh, ho hopefully folks at home can sort of see, but a, a ton of detail work went into... Uh, enemy animations and stupid purple dinosaur again. I hate that guy. What's his name, <laughs> Phil? It, it, I think they were calling it the Wither Beast right now. Uh, he's actually even harder in this in this particular build, I think, than the one we played before. He's actually when he burrows, his health regen is so high right now that me as the apprentice cannot take him out by myself because my attack damage. Stupid <laughs> purple dinosaur. <laughs> Alexander, I'm so, sensing like a deep-rooted hatred of purple dinosaurs. Seriously, it's here. like it's like some Barney rage came back, <laughs> and it, and he's the worst. Like when you actually play the game, the purple, di the burrowing purple dinosaur is like one where you're just like, what am I supposed to do against this guy? He's the worst. <laughs> yeah. So for the people who don't know, the the Wither Beast is a, is a new character that is actually a support class for the enemies. So he runs up ahead of all the enemies and burrows in the ground, and if he successfully burrows, uh, he has health regen, so he's really, really hard to kill, and he has this aura around him which debuffs all the towers in the area, so it makes the enemies a lot more effective against your defenses. So he can, he can get a little annoying. But at the same time, it's fun to tell your friends that how annoying he is and try to get them all to come over and help you take him out. Uh. One last uh, little question here from the uh, chat before we before we head into the end of the stream. Uh, Leap Horus wants to know: Will there be epic instances like in WoW? Maybe things you can only attempt once every day or so. 
We have some long-term plans to do some stuff like that. <laughs> Hooray! Yay, hey, we won. Oh man, skin of the teeth! <laughs> Take that, purple dinosaurs! Stupid purple <laughs> dinosaur. Uh, for anybody who might just be tuning in, uh, where the hell were you? It's almost five o'clock. We broadcast at four o'clock, and that's when you should always come by. Uh, this has been a, another broadcast of Joystick Streams. Uh, Trendy Entertainment joined us today. They are the makers of Dungeon Defenders and what we've been playing today, Dungeon Defenders 2, which is in its pre-alpha state. Uh, Philip Asher has been guiding us, and uh, our own Alexander Slowinski has been playing with he and Corey and Patrick from the Trendy QA team. Uh, Phil, any parting words for anyone if they want to try out the pre-alpha version of Dungeon Defenders 2? How can they do that? What would you like to tell uh, the people? Yeah, so if you, if you guys want to check out and help us work on Dungeon Defenders 2, uh, you can head over to our site, which is DungeonDefenders2.com, and just participate in our community. And we've been giving away uh, council and pre-alpha access uh, for people who comment on the blogs and who are active participants in the community. So check us out. We do blogs twice a week, uh, giving people development updates on the game. And obviously, this, the game is far, far, far away from a final release, but if you, you know, wanted to give people a sort of timeline of the coming year, uh, what do you see as the roadmap for Dungeon Defenders 2? So right now, it's just an ever-increasing uh, soft launch. Uh, we're actually increasing it this weekend. Uh, if you know anyone who is in our pre-alpha access, they're going to have three friend codes to give away. Uh, starting this week, so if you want to get in, you might want to hit up your friends who are already playing. Uh, beyond then, it's up to it's up to anyone's guess. We're going to keep expanding soft launch throughout spring, and go from there. Very cool, Alexander. Uh, any words of advice for people out there who are dealing with severe purple dinosaur Stupid problems? Stupid purple <laughs> dinosaur. Uh, no, I, I would strongly recommend uh, signing up and and helping the trendy team. Uh, test the test the game and getting in uh, the it's if you've played the original one uh, the original dungeon defenders it is a solid sequel so far uh, and whatever feedback you can give them will only make the game better for when the game is finally done and uh, and and I appreciate uh, you working for them for free because that makes <laughs> that makes my life a lot easier uh, later on uh as always, everybody, you can catch us every single Tuesday and Thursday here at 4 p.m. Uh, coming up this Thursday, we have another little session with a developer. Yacht Club Games is going to be hanging out with us as we play through Shovel Knight, their oh, sweet little pixelated uh, Metroidvania that's coming out to... <laughs> Patrick, PC do you have something to say about that? <laughs> oh, I said it. Cool. I said it. I'm excited for that game. It right? looks hot, right? It is. I want everything to do with that game, and Yacht Club is going to be hanging out with us to show off a pretty much finished version. The game was supposed to come out on March 31st, but they have pushed it back into April for a la some last-minute polishing. Um, and if you guys want to tune in tomorrow on Wednesday, there might be a little bit of a special stream at 4 p.m., uh, and that's all I'm going to say about that right now. Wait, secret streams? Are we secret, <laughs> secret streams, Secret yo. streams? That's something we're doing now? Okay. Secret streams. If you want to know about tomorrow's stream and everything else we've got going on at joystick.com, you can follow us on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash joystick. Same thing for Facebook. If you want to follow us on Google+, and that's your thing, it's plus.google.com slash joystick, or just... Freaking Google the name. It'll come up. It'll be right there. Uh, you can follow us right here on Twitch. And if you want to know what Alexander and I are up to, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, that's twitter.com slash ajohnagnello and twitter.com slash slowinski. And I am about to post all of those lovely little uh, URLs right here in the chat. And, yeah, thank you so much for coming by, everybody. Thank you, Trendy Entertainment, for uh, hanging out with us. This was a real treat. Thank, thank you guys for playing with us. And let us know when you're, when you're close, to, close to done 
when when all yeah. the when all the little minions have done all their work for you and, and we'd be <laughs> happy to have you guys back yeah we would love to awesome all right thank you for coming out everybody we'll see you tomorrow but definitely Secrets. Thursday. <laughs>